So, chapter three. If we've seen that we can generate power renewably, let's focus a little now on the use of power. And here is a photograph of some power being used, uh, and specifically in the melt shop of a steel plant where iron ore is being melted down in blast furnaces. This is topical today, actually, because an example of what I'm talking about is very much in the news at Port Talbot. Um, so what we need is plans for the steel industry, and in fact, all industries, as I said, for buildings, for industry. I'm going to focus on just two examples. I'll say a little bit about transport, and I'll say a little bit about agriculture, of examples of how we can decarbonize stuff. Transport. Right. Does anyone here own an electric car? One, two, three, I can see a few. Very good. I mean, actually, the really cool kids would say they own no car. They get around uh, uh, in human power. So there are a billion cars in the world. It's a $3 trillion industry. And half the cost of an electric car is its battery. And I'll tell you a little story. Um, a decade ago, the US Department of Energy set a stretch target for reducing the cost of those batteries because they were pretty expensive. This is the cost of storing a kilowatt hour in a lithium ion battery, and it used to be just under $1,200. So their target was by 2020 to see if the industry could get that down to $200. That's the red line there. Who thinks they made it? Who thinks they didn't make it? Ah, that's right. Uh, very few votes for didn't, and of course I wouldn't be t highlighting it if they hadn't made it. They made it by 2018, and the price has continued to go down since then. Again, a little blip in 2021. Uh, I don't have a figure for this year, or 2023, but it's forecast to continue down much further. They blew through it a couple of years early, um, and so the price is much lower now. And watch out, here is my good friend Shell Valoan with the world's first electric lorry. So vans and trucks, so-called commercial vehicles, account for one in seven vehicles on the road, but 30% of all emissions. And this example being assembled in Austria has a medium range for local deliveries. Volvo has also developed a 40-tonne 16-metre truck with a 400-kilometre range, which is all you can drive in a day anyway. So what this means in terms of the forecast numbers of these electric vehicles on the road is that in 2010, there was practically 0.2%, very few. Green is electric here. 2022, 13%, one in seven, as I said. The forecast is for 2025, these figures from The Economist, 35%, um, it seems high, doesn't it? And 2040, 75% of the vehicles on the road electric. Now, it does seem high, I mean, you might challenge that, but consider this. I was amazed when I saw this the other day, data from our very own, this is UK figures now, those were global, um, the UK British Department of Transport, these are new car registrations, so not on the road, but sales in the, well, this millennium. And it's a story of petrol, diesel, and electric, essentially. So battery electric, plug-in hybrid, and regular hybrid. And, you know, petrol sales and diesel sales are going up and down. In the case of diesel, very solidly down. But look at this. Look at what happened during COVID. In 2022, 43% of new car registrations in the UK were electric. Now, in Europe, that figure was 47%, a record-breaking 4.4 million units in Europe. And three, actually, of those best-selling models um, were Chinese. is the one that definitely deserves a prize. Anyone know what that is? Anyone drive one of these? BYD? B 
biggest electric car maker in the world. As of last quarter, they overtook Tesla. This is a Chinese brand, and the Chinese are coming. Xpeng, recognize this? These are the brands. Of, yeah. yeah. The, uh, this is the cover of The Economist this week. You know, the car industry is uh, terrified by uh, the arrival of these uh, very low cost, in many cases, um, car models. It has been forecast that by the mid 2020s, the cost of an electric car will be comparable to that of an internal combustion engine car. I can tell you that the cheapest models available in domestic Chinese markets now are retailing at about $11,000. So whether we're able, ever able to get our hands on them for that price or whether there'll be hefty import tariffs, I suspect there will be. But you know, essentially, technologically, this nut has been cracked and cheap electric transport is about to be available for all of us. So... For electric, the electrification of transport, at least road transport, is going well. And we can talk afterwards, if you'd like, about rail or air. Let's talk about agriculture. And here it is, agriculture. I love an overview me, and this is, courtesy of the US Geological Survey, all the agriculture in the world on one, one map. It's highlighted in green. All the areas of the earth given over to farming 1.87 billion hectares on one chart. Um, doesn't look like that. So that's, uh, let me see, 35% of the world's land area. It doesn't look like that, does it? That's because this is a Mercator's projection map, which Greenland has long complained makes it look fat. And I have another one. There is the uh, Golpeter's projection, which switches the... Uh, it's the same green for agriculture, and now added in, the brown areas are where livestock farming happens. Um, so here's another one for a prize. Can anyone tell me the world's farmingest country? The country with the biggest area of land given over to agriculture. Did someone say Denmark? Um, it would be a surprise. Any advance on Denmark? Come on, geographers. Russia. Very good guess, sir. No. Russia is third with 155 million hectares. Where? You don't eat chocolate, okay. I'm not going to offer that for your guess of Russia. It's Ukraine is another good guess. It's actually India with a whopping uh, 179 million hectares, uh, is the world's most farming country, uh, farmingest country. So I keep my chocolates on that one. So agriculture is vastly significant, and we need to talk about cows. This is a cow. Um, and we're talking about enteric methane emissions. Um, I'll show you an enteric methane emission. <laughs> Sorry about that, Dr. Cotton. In fact, that was uh, most of the, mostly it's actually burping rather than farting. But one cow can generate 500 litres a day of methane. That's 100 kilograms a year, which is more emissions than a car. And there are a billion cows on the planet. So methane from livestock contributes 3.7% of all anthropogenic, that's man made greenhouse gas emissions, according to the company Ruminate. Um, it is a very difficult problem, which is why I brought it up as one of the more intractable problems. Uh, if we're going to tackle the methane problem, we have to tackle this. But even here, there is some hope, and technology is beginning to offer at least an approach to dealing with the problem. And now we need to talk about red seaweed, or as we should properly call it, uh, marine algae. Here is some red seaweed being cultivated in a pilot project by the company Sea Forest, um, a 2023 finalist in Prince William's Earthshot Prize competition. Um, and there are others doing something similar. Red seaweed, when processed and dried, is nature's natural anti-methanogenic compound. 
because when it's dried into a feedstock for cattle, as here, it's been shown in tests to reduce methanogenic enteric emissions by up to 60%, in fact, more than 60% in some tests. So even here, in this most hard-to-abate sector, that means hard to decarbonise, there is real progress and a path to tackling the emissions. It is important to note that in addition to cows, methane is also given off naturally by peat wetlands and other forms of agriculture, such as rice paddies, actually, and landfill sites. Okay, 